Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. Welcome to the daily vlog. I'm glad you're here. Today's vlog is actually going to be the start of a pretty big project because I'm going to be taking the Arboreal XL. That's that enclosure behind me. It's made by Custom Reptile Habitats and it's actually the Chameleon Academy branded line. I designed this specifically for our needs. Now you've seen this behind me for the past couple of months and I've, I've made it up kind of nice and it's got some plants in there and it's doing quite well. But more than a chameleon, I did a poll on my social media sites and say, well, what would you like to see in there? And overwhelmingly, people decided they wanted to see a community enclosure. What that means is there's gonna be more than one species in that enclosure. Community enclosures are very tricky. And it's something that I hesitated to get involved with, mainly because I want to be very careful as to who emulates what I do. I want to make it very clear. Before you have a community situation, and a community means you have more than one uh, reptile in the enclosure. Now, we know we don't keep chameleons together. <laughs> they are individuals, and they are individually kept. But in this case, I'm talking about having a chameleon, having a gecko, and having a frog. And these are very carefully chosen so they won't interfere with each other's living. Now, yes, they will bump into each other. They will see each other on occasion. But I think it goes without saying, got to make sure that they don't eat each other. Having a community situation is something to go into with a lot of planning. And I'm going to go ahead and do that planning with you. For the next five or seven episodes of this vlog, we are going to be doing it together. And the reason why it's so complex is that, uh, say I put one reptile in there, one chameleon, I have one main environment to look out for, and I have a number of different microclimates. But when I do, say, a, a chameleon in the branches, and then I do a frog on the forest floor, well, with a chameleon, the substrate is just like a supporting character. Okay, it provides humidity, and maybe it provides a place to have isopods where the chameleon might hunt them every now and then. So the substrate becomes a supporting microclimate. If I have a dart frog at the bottom, not only are the branches a major uh, environment that I need to pay attention to. Well, now the forest floor is a major environment that I need to pay attention to. And if I add in a nocturnal gecko, now I've got to have a different aspect of the branches and the trees. And so you can see how the more complex you make this enclosure, well, the more planning and the more maintenance to make sure everything is balanced that you have to do. And of course, it's wonderful that this is a daily vlog. And so once it's up and running, you're going to be able to see on a daily basis what it takes to maintain something like that. You're going to be able to see in real time if there are any interactions that we didn't expect. All in all, I think it's going to be an incredible experience. And I'll be glad to have you along to experience it with me. There is going to be a list of things that we are going to have to do to prepare for this situation. And the first one is something we're going to go over today is what are the reptiles that are going to be in the enclosure? And two, I'm going to give you a tour of the enclosure so that you understand the features and the topography that we are working with. In the subsequent vlogs, we're going to be talking about light, UVB, heat gradients, the hydration cycle, plants, substrate, branches, invertebrates, and what I have to do to change the enclosure. You see it's uh, set up right now and it's nice and beautiful, but I may have to change some things. I mean, I already know I'm gonna have to change some things. So uh, the beautiful scene that you see back there may be partially or completely taken down. It'll break my heart, but that's what we have to do. And so we're gonna be going over this all together. But the first job we're going to do today is talk about the inhabitants and the canvas. So the way I'm going to be doing this is I'm going to be putting up a picture of the inside of this enclosure. And then as I talk about what I want to put in the enclosure, we will kind of color out the uh, areas that they're going to inhabit. So the first one that's going to go in is 
a female carpet chameleon. This is Daisy, and many of you have already met Daisy through this vlog. Daisy is a wild-caught chameleon, and so there's an added complication that she needs to be fully acclimated before she goes in. And I'll just let you know, the safest thing to do is not to use a wild-caught ever for a bioactive environment. You always run the risk of something you missed getting in there. I have elected that I will deparasitize her and make sure she's clean before she goes in, and I'm going to take that risk. Now, carpet chameleons, they are somewhere gregarious. They will be out in the open and they will want to be hidden a little bit. So I expect Daisy to use the top half of the enclosure. In the middle is going to be this thick foliage layer, so she can hide if she wants to, but I expect her to spend a good amount of time in the branches above the plant layer. This is where she's going to be able to find her UVB. This is where she's going to be able to find her basking branch. And this is the behavior of a carpet chameleon. Now, there were a number of species of chameleons that I did consider. There was like the mini Kalumas, Kaluma linotum or rural loco. These are very small Kaluma, very small, but they don't necessarily want to be up out in the open, they're gonna be wanting to be in the foliage. Now there's two reasons why I decided to go to with the carpet chameleon, first of lateralis, and one is that I wanted something back there that we could see. So when I have these vlogs, when I have the live sessions, I wanna be able to point the camera up and see who's in there. Uh, eventually, I'd love to be able to hand feed Daisy. So <laughs> we'll see if I can tame her down to that point. And the carpet chameleon is a good choice for a chameleon that, when she settles in, won't have a problem being out in the open. So she's going to be a good visual subject, as well as there is a growing carpet chameleon community that I love to support. Every year or two, I have an episode about carpet chameleons because it's a great community. And if you want to start breeding, the carpet chameleon is the ideal species to start with. It's got smaller clutches. The babies are in great demand, so you're not going to have a problem selling the babies, as long as they're healthy. You're not going to be competing with the already uh, saturated panther chameleon breeding market. And once again, they're smaller, and so it's a lot easier to raise them up. Now, they're not as easy to breed as panther chameleons, but that is something that's essentially just a recipe. You can do the diapause. It's, it's not a problem as long as you have the right equipment. The biggest challenge that people have when they breed chameleons is selling the babies. And in this case, carpet chameleons, they have small clutches and it's easy to sell. So I'm very encouraging of breeding carpet chameleons. And add to that, she's absolutely gorgeous. And so that really made my decision for me. So she is the inhabitant of this enclosure that's going to gravitate towards the top third of the enclosure. Now, she won't be there all the time. She will be all over the enclosure, but that is where I intend to create an environment where she is going to feel the most comfort. Now, the environmental aspects that we're going to take into account with a carpet chameleon is the ambient temperature is gonna be in the low to mid 70s. She is going to want a solid source of UVB, and so I'm going to provide a UV index of three at a branch that's about six inches below the top of the enclosure. The UVB light will have little effect to the rest of the inhabitants because it won't get below the plant layer. And finally, she's gonna want a basking bulb. This, as you will see later on in the analysis, is going to become the parameter that I am going to have to control the most careful. Everything in this community enclosure is going to want to be in the low 70s. And so I cannot afford for the basking bulb to heat up this enclosure. Obviously, it needs to be big enough to heat up an area directly in front of it, but it needs to be a small enough wattage bulb that it's not going to affect the entire enclosure. I will also control it by having it come on only for an hour or two in the morning. I will watch very carefully to see how long she uses it and only have it on for that amount of time. And this is the kind of thing that you really have to look after. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the middle third. This is going to be a heavily planted layer. 
I'm going to have thick foliage and I'm going to have a lot of networking branches in here. And, and what I mean by that is like a perching branch, that's where I expect like the chameleon to spend most of its time. And so it's specifically uh, selected for its diameter versus her feet. The networking branches, those are just branches that are going to be all over the place at different uh, diameters, and they're not necessarily going to have a specific purpose other than to make various uh, areas of the cage accessible. So the middle layer, heavy foliage, lots of networking branches. And this is where I'm going to have a Europlatus fantasticus, a gecko also known as uh, the satanic leaf-tailed gecko. The chameleon is going to be active during the day and the gecko is going to be active during the night. So during the night, the gecko is going to be bouncing around all over the enclosure. So many times the mistake is made to think that Europlatus stay still. They only stay still because when we're viewing them, they're asleep. Go ahead, sneak into your reptile room at night and watch your Europlatus. They are bouncing all over the place. And so this enclosure right here is a perfect size for a Europlatus fantasticus. So I'm going to make sure that this little fant has access to as much of the area in this enclosure as possible. And then when the morning comes, our little fant is going to find a place out of the way to sleep through the day. Theoretically, the chameleon and the fant are not going to run into each other. Now, in actual practice, I am sure somewhere along the way, the fant is going to land on the chameleon and jump off of the chameleon. The chameleon is gonna say, wow, that was a bad dream. And the chameleon may crawl over the fant in the middle of the day if for whatever reason, the fant is now sleeping out in the open. These kind of things can happen. And it's gonna be up to me to watch to make sure that they don't happen in a way that is entirely uh, disruptive to either of them, or that it happens more than once in a great while. If they are literally crawling all over each other, then it's not an appropriate environment, and I've got to figure out how to make that work so they're not crawling over each other, or separate them. And one advantage I have is that both the Fantasticus and the Carpet Chameleon eat the same size food. Two-week crickets are great for both. Now we get to the lower third of the cage, and this is going to be a Dendrobates azurius, the blue poison dart frog. Now don't worry about it, they don't have that famously poisoned skin when they eat the fruit flies that we feed them in captivity. They need to eat a special ant to be able to develop those toxins on the skin. So this frog is not going to be dangerous to me or any of the cage inhabitants. And by the way, all of these cage inhabitants, their mouths are way too small for them to think of any of the others as prey. Now, should I ever decide to start breeding, then I will have to reevaluate. Now, a baby carpet chameleon is probably still too big for a Europlatus fantasticus to try to eat, and a baby fantasticus is too big for the frog to eat, but the carpet chameleon may try, depending upon how hungry she is. And baby frogs, if I want to breed the dart frog, that may be a problem. I could see the chameleon trying to pick off Little Blue's snack, so I will have to take these things into consideration if I decide to breed any of them. The frog will eat mostly fruit flies, and so he'll have his own cafeteria. Now what happens if the two-week crickets jump out of the feeder run cup or whatever I have and get into the soil and run around? Will they cause problems with the dart frog? I will be watching out for that. I have asked people who have kept dart frogs and had two-week crickets and dart frogs in the same enclosure, and so far I'm told that they don't believe that this will be a problem. So I feel confident that I can go into it, that it will probably work. But of course, I will be watching carefully to make sure that it doesn't cause a problem. Now, I think the dart frog is going to cause the biggest change in this enclosure behind me because I want to add more than just flat topography. Dart frogs will climb and I want to give these dart frogs the opportunity to do that. And if they want to climb up the side so they can get to a warmer area like the, the basking, I will want to create a mountain of sorts in the corner under the basking lamp so they have that option. Remember, this is always about options. It's not about what will they do, what won't they do, and controlling that. It is setting things up so all of them have the option to do what they want. So that's what we're going to work with. Those are the three species that I'm gonna be looking to put in there. I actually have all three of them already. 
And so all I have to do is set up the enclosure and then they can be introduced. And let's not forget the layer below the frog in the substrate. Into there I'm going to be doing, of course, the springtails. Probably won't be able to keep the springtails from there. And then the isopods, I think I'm going to be going with the Costa Rican purple. There were a couple that I could go with, but I think the Costa Rican purple is the one I want to go with. Okay, so that's what we're going to be working with as far as what's going in here. I have all of them in this room, except for the, <laughs> the isopods. And so I can introduce them as it's appropriate. The carpet chameleon, though, does have to go through quarantine and I have to check for parasites and make sure she is absolutely clean before she goes in. So let's go ahead and take a look at the canvas. What is it we have to work with? This is the Chameleon Academy Arboreal XL enclosure made by Custom Reptile Habitats. This enclosure was made to my specifications, so all of this is uh, my credit and my fault. I designed this specifically so we chameleon people could have fun with Bioactive. It is a PVC enclosure that's three feet wide in the front, 30 inches deep from front to back, and 48 inches tall. Since it's going to be a high humidity environment, I have glass doors because acrylic tends to warp in high moisture environments. There are nine inches for substrate at the bottom of the enclosure. And of course it does have ventilation so you can get the chimney effect. The cool air comes in through the bottom, warms up and goes out the top screen. One unique feature of this enclosure is I wanted the forest floor viewing window. Usually the visual starts above the vents, but I wanted to be able to see at the floor level. And so Paul, who runs Custom Reptile Habitats, gave me my forest floor viewing window. I'm very proud of that feature and I'm gonna be using it to its fullest extent. Now, because this is for arboreal reptiles, I wanted to be able to mount branches and potted plants up to the middle levels of the enclosure. And that's why we have these branch anchors. This is very much like the dragon ledges that I invented a long time ago, but it's modified for this particular use. These branch anchors allow you to lash on some, some strong branches and they're strong enough that you can lash on potted plants. This allows you to get the pothos and the hoya and all these substantial vining plants and put them up where the chameleons can use them. If you look on the back, there's an option to put on these uh, backdrops. And this gives you a forest scene. These enclosures come standard with the plain black interior, but I really suggest getting the backdrop option because it brightens up the inside. But of course, you decide what's best for your application. Now the top panel was specifically designed. You have the main lighting area that's big enough for a four bulb T5 fixture. Or you can have your LED bars and your T5 UVB, but you get this space here that you can put whatever is appropriate. It's designed for the two foot lengths of the LED bars and the UVB fixtures, but you can put any combination. Now you'll notice I said that this was 30 inches from front to back. Usually our enclosures are 24 inches. I specifically wanted that extra six inches so I could fit slots for LED bars in the very front and the very back. And what this does is it allows the middle layer of plants to soak up your main lights and that keeps them healthy, but the LED bars on the front and the back have a clear shot down to the forest floor and so the light gets down there. And of course you don't need to put in all lights, you can leave them open and get more ventilation, but when you fill that up with lights, Oh my goodness, it is amazing how the interior pops and the kind of plants that you can grow in there. We have a screened cutout for a basking bulb and closer to the front, there is a screened cutout that's specifically designed for ventilation and you can put a fan there if you need more ventilation than just the chimney effect. There are places for three mist heads along the front and in the back rear, there's an opening for a fogger. And this entire enclosure sits on furniture that was specifically designed for the Arboreal XL. And to the side, I've got these cubby shelves that I can put books and fruit fly cultures in my solar meter. This was designed to look good in your home. All right, folks, there's your canvas and you know what we're trying to do. Tomorrow, we're gonna dive into the light, UVB and heat. How are we going to produce those things in this enclosure and how are we going to manage them so the participants on all tiers of the enclosure are happy? 
And if you like this enclosure and the furniture around it, they are for sale now at Custom Reptile Habitats. A link to the Chameleon Academy section of the Custom Reptile Habitats webpage is in the description below. This is an affiliate relationship, so you purchasing these enclosures supports this show. And I greatly appreciate the support you all have shown already. And if you have any questions about how to set up this cage, how to use it, that's what I'm here for. And I have live sessions twice a week, Tuesdays, 5 p.m. Pacific here on YouTube and Instagram, and Saturdays at 12 noon Pacific here on YouTube. And of course, you can just watch this vlog because every morning we're going to be going through how to set it up, how to maintain it, and we're going to be having fun with the inhabitants that are in the enclosure. The owner, Paul Barclay, is passionate about moving our herpeticulture forward, and he's been a great support to many of us content creators. And so he's a good company to have in our community. One thing that's very cool about Custom Reptile Habitats is they have a dedicated customer service line. So if you have questions as to how to order, or where is your order, or when your order is going to ship, or how do I assemble this thing, there is a dedicated customer service line with a customer service representative that is full-time there, and so you're well supported. All right, this has become a little bit of an extra long vlog, but I'm imagining where we're gonna have a lot to cover in the days coming up, because we've got a very exciting project that we're in the middle of. And so I wanna thank you all very much for being here, especially those of you who get up at five in the morning Every morning I premiere this vlog at 5 a.m. Pacific on YouTube and there's a group of people who actually get up in the morning at 5 a.m. just to be there in the chat and we have a great time. And so I thank you all because this is an absolute blast to do. Have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow at 5 a.m.